this be the welcoming place, the place of return, and let it be built by a love that bends towards those who return here. For it is a love that has been waiting, like a candle in the window, ever lighting the way back, and never willing to let go the hope that each child will return home. Let it be the place where the only appropriate response to love that has come to the end of its longing is to feast and celebrate, send up balloons and prepare the party. For that which has been lost has returned to be among us once more. Let us worship God. Friends, trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sins together to our holy God. Let us pray. Holy One, we confess that we have wandered far from you. We have not trusted your promises. We have ignored your prophets in our own day. We have squandered our inheritance of grace. We have failed to recognize you in our midst. Have mercy on us. Forgive us and turn us again to you. Teach us to follow in your ways. Assure us again of your love and help us to love our neighbor. Amen.
The God of compassion welcomes the wayward and embraces all of us with mercy. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. In Jesus Christ, we are a new creation. Lord be with you. Good morning. Please be seated. Friends, welcome to worship at Kirk in the Hills Presbyterian Church. We are delighted to have you gathered here together today. Here in the sanctuary or whether you're online or at Kirk West, we are glad to have you part of this worshiping community. We invite you to fill out the ritual of friendship pads that are found in the pews. And if you would please pass those back and forth and see that as an invitation to greet those uh, around you as well as to offer a special welcome to any who are our guests this morning. We're delighted to have you here especially. As we uh, gather this morning, it's a, a, a wonderful opportunity. This is our Kai's weekend, uh, a, a, a gift by Roger Kai's to uh, perpetuate through the generations to bring in speakers to uh, help us inspire us, give us grace, help us see a broader church and a broader world. And this weekend has just been marvelous with Dr. Susan McDonald. She has uh, been a blessing in the, the lectures that she's given both for her scholarship and for the ways that she loves the church and just plain loves people. Uh, it is a delight to have her here. She, uh, as you can read about her in the, uh, in, the, in the bulletin, she went to Oxford and Cambridge and St. Andrews. Uh, she's got quite a, quite a pedigree of, uh, of schools that she's been to, uh, and we are blessed to have her with us this morning. Would you join me in a special welcome to Dr. Susan McDonald? <clears throat> As we gather uh, this morning, I would uh, just lift up, uh, there are quite a number of things you can read about them at, in, at the Kirk, but I wanna say especially, Dinner Church begins this Wednesday. Uh, I'll be leading uh, a Bible study on the Gospel of Mark. I love doing the Gospel of Mark. It was the first Gospel that was written, uh, and, and you'd swear that the writer uh, had such urgency uh, that he was running while he wrote it. Uh, it, it, it will be a fun study, uh, something that is there for all levels, uh, and, and I would invite you to come and have uh, a soup uh, dinner and then join us for the study uh, and some light, uh, some light uh, conversation. And, uh, and it's just uh, something that I've been looking forward to all fall. It's a rare opportunity that I get to teach and I'm looking forward to being with you at that. There's other things going on in the life of the church and I would uh, commend you to, to look at those. Uh, but at this time, uh, I would like to invite Tanya Skilton to come to the lectern. Tanya is kicking off our stewardship messages in which in our theme of making love your goal, uh, we have asked these speakers to just share part of their story, part of their love for God, part of their love for the church. Uh, Tanya, thank you for leading off here. that he would use my words this morning in our reflections about Jesus in your name. I'm here to share just a little bit about what the Kirk in the Hills means to me personally, Tanya, and to my family um, who are sitting there. So um, I'll start with the story of how we arrived here. Um, 
If you would bear with me, maybe even close your eyes and picture this. I know you all can because you are here in Michigan and this is familiar and it's coming our way. The sky was gunmetal gray, the sort of bluish gray color that makes me think of images of submarines emerging out of the cold, dark waters of a cold northern ocean. The leafless trees stood out against the sky like awkward skeletons apologizing for their lack of dress, the lack of warmth on that steel cold winter afternoon when we as a family arrived here in Michigan. We piled into our Detroit Cab Company taxi on the way to the Kingsley Inn, which was to be our first home here for a little while until we found a home. And no one said anything. We passed through neighborhoods where homes are broken down and, you know, clearly broke, you know, um, burned down. And then neighborhoods where there was so much plenty and prosperity was startling. We, didn't, we hadn't seen that before. And we were all wondering if we'd made a mistake. We were very far from friends and family. See, Dom and I met in Australia where we had our children. And then we moved to Singapore, and we were just arriving from Singapore. It was warm, 24 hours a day, every single day, every single day. <laughs> well, in the seven years that have passed since then, we have found an amazing home. We have two corgi doggies that keep us warm. And we've all settled into life, work, school, all of it. But the hardest part of the journey all of it, moving from Australia to Singapore to Detroit. The steepest and the most winding part of our journey was looking for our earthly heaven, our church home. Dom and I looked when we first got married in Australia and we found some things, some places where we felt a little bit at home. And then we moved and, and the journey continued. And we did find churches along the way, but we never really quite felt at home. When we first arrived here, it was a few days before Christmas, three days exactly, and so we knew we had to find a church, and we passed a church on Telegraph Road and on the way to the hotel, and I thought, all right, that's the name, I'll look it up, and we did end up there for a couple of years. Um, we thought we found home, but, but it wasn't quite the same. It wasn't home yet. And then Priyanka, our daughter, when she was in seventh grade, came to the Kirk for the seventh grade visit to places of worship. And she's a visual artist, and she came home delighted by the beauty of this place and asking to come here. And when your 12-year-old child says, I want to go to church and I want to go to that one, you absolutely jump on that opportunity. And we did, and we found home. What makes this place feel like home? We feel like every single one of us, Dominic, Priyanka, Tudor, and I, we have rest here from our searching. We have welcome for us exactly as we are for who we are. And we found here that Jesus calls us to be used for his purposes. And we feel here the delight that God takes in his children and the pleasure that he has when we seek his word and we let the Holy Spirit work in us. Two weeks ago, even before I knew I was going to be asked to do this, I was in my daily reading and I came across this passage from Isaiah and I pictured the Kirk as I read it, the images of this wonderful place and this incredible heartfelt congregation came to mind. So this is Isaiah 60 from 1 through 6. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples, 
but the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar, and your daughters are carried on the hip. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you. To you the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will come, will cover your land. Young camels of Midian and Ephah, and all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. In the short time that we have joined the Kirk as members, we have been immensely blessed here to belong to the church, to the body of Christ. I am now a member of the Outreach and Missions Committee, and I've been blessed there with new friendships and the opportunity to learn and to practice discernment in how we use the generosity of this wonderful congregation to bless the people around us with the wonderful news of Jesus and his saving grace. So, seven years on from when we first arrived on that cold, cold day in December, we are home. And just like we clean and decorate and maintain our physical home, Dom and I also care for the Kirk, our church home, our heaven on earth. We do give our time and our talents and our treasure because we want others like us that are coming from faraway lands or worse, from the wilderness of life away from Christ to come here to this place and to find their home just as we have. And so I'll just close with a request that you perhaps reflect on your own story. We all have wonderful stories that the Lord has written for us. Reflect on it and wonder how you might also contribute back to this home that we have here on this earth till we go home to our eternal home. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Tanya. Would the children please come forward for the children's message? And while they are coming forward, please feel free to greet those around you. Good morning. Good morning. Bye, bye. Hey. Love your hoodie. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi. Good to see you again. Good morning. I love it. So many kids. It's great. Tanya, I was deeply touched by your words. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, okay. I told Pastor Edwin this morning that he was getting a few shout outs because Pastor Edwin taught me something about what the congregation is going to talk about this morning. They're going to learn about a parable that Jesus talked about in the book. It's recorded in the book of Luke, okay, in the New Testament. And Pastor Edwin showed me and some other people from Outreach and Mission, Tanya, this painting. Take a look at this painting, okay? I showed this to Nell this morning. This is like a very grown-up painting. And Nell was like, I don't know about this painting. Parents, there's a lot of copies of this painting outside. This is a Rembrandt, he's a famous artist, and he painted his interpretation of the parable. So in this painting, there's something really important about it. You can see this man's hands, okay? I want you to imagine what it feels like when someone hugs you and holds you. What does it feel like? Happy, yeah, warm, like comforting, okay? In this painting, this man's hands are so big and welcoming and holding this man. And this man is, is 
is pretty sad, but also looks very comforted. And the way Jesus tells the story is that this man, this dad, had two sons. And one son was kind of a rebel. He broke all the rules. He said, I don't want to live here. I want my money. I want to get out. And the father said, okay. And he did. And he went. And he spent a bunch of money. And he lost all his money. And he even started living with the pigs. And you can see like his feet in this painting are kind of look like he's had a tough life. And then the other brother, this guy, he followed all the rules. He was kind of the good son. Didn't look like he did anything wrong. He worked hard for his dad. And then one day, the dad, he sees this son, the one who was the rebel who broke all the rules, coming home to him. Coming home and saying, I'm sorry, I want to... I should have been here. I want to come home to you. And you know what the father did? He ran to him. He said, come home. I want to throw you a party. I'm just so glad you're home with me. And meanwhile, this guy, the good son, the one that kept all the rules, he was kind of upset in his heart. But people didn't know that. But God knew it. God knew that his heart also needed healing. So Jesus tells this parable because this father is like our father. It was like God saying, I am here. I'm forgiving you. I know if you break all the rules on the outside and everyone notices, and I know if you break the rules on the inside of your heart, and I need you to tell me about it. So we can be so thankful and honest with God the Father that he welcomes us with his arms and his hands and holds us anytime we're ready to go to him. Okay? So let's pray the Lord's Prayer together, and then we'll go off to Sunday school. They threw a big party. They did. Okay, let's put our hands together. We're going to lead the congregation in the Lord's Prayer, okay? Our Father... Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Right, everybody, we'll go under over there, and then we'll go to Abbey Lounge.
response to God's amazing and lavish grace, we have the gift, the opportunity to give of our time, treasure, and talent. As you heard the testimony today, we have launched our stewardship campaign. And we hope that you will support this place as a spiritual home. Friends, let us pray. God, we are so thankful that your mercies are new every morning. You draw near to us in Jesus Christ, offering us grace, grace beyond our wildest imagination. We're thankful now for the opportunity we have to respond to that grace and to give of what we have to the glory of your name, the building up of your church, and the healing of the world you love so much. In Christ's name, amen.
Before we turn to our scripture text this morning, it's simply something I want to say how good it is to be here at the Kirk. I have had the most wonderful few days and you have all given me the warmest of welcomes. I'm honoured to be here, glad to have been able to share a number of things over this weekend and now especially to share the word of the Lord with you this morning. As we come to our scripture reading, let's pray. Lord, Holy Spirit, we ask that you open our ears to hear, our minds to understand, and our hearts to receive the word. Plant that word down deep in us, cause it to bear fruit, we pray, so that by your power we might become more and more like Jesus and live more fully to the praise and glory of the Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Our reading is from Luke chapter 15, first verses 1 through 3, and then verses 11 to 32, that very, very familiar parable. Hear the word of the Lord. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and travelled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Get the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his eldest son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come home, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he's got him back, safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you. I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, the one who's devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, You are always with me. All that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The word of the Lord. Where is home for you, I wonder? And what makes home feel like home for you? I suspect that's an interesting question for a lot of us. And we heard something of a response from Tanya this morning, and it's a very strange question for me in many ways as well. Is home Australia, where I was born and brought up? Is it the UK, where my parents are from, and where I lived for over 10 years? Or is home here in the US, where I've been now for over 15 years, although you wouldn't know it, 
from my accent. What does it mean when we say that we feel at home somewhere or that we don't feel at home? Is home a place like when you're driving back from out of state and you see the pure Michigan sign and you know on the highway you are home? Or is it more about relationships? Or is it all of these things? And what about when you technically are at home, but you wish you could be anywhere else? This is a parable that can get us thinking about questions like that. What makes home home? And what does it feel like to leave home and to come back home? And what does it mean to feel far from home, even when we are <coughs> at home. Jesus is telling this parable to some people who feel very much at home with God. And they're also very sure about who should not be at home with God. The start of our reading, the frame for the parable, describes the scribes and the Pharisees who are grumbling about Jesus because he has this habit of welcoming and eating with tax collectors and sinners. There was often rivalry between the scribes and the Pharisees, but they were united in despising sinners and also in despising Jesus for hanging out with them. If Jesus were a truly godly man, he would not be so at home with sinners, nor they with him. They were probably also united in each seeing themselves as the ones who are most at home with God, the righteous ones, the most truly obedient and faithful ones. And so they assume they are the ones God loves and cares about the most, unlike those sinners. And so Jesus tells some parables. Our parable this morning is actually the third in a sequence. First, Jesus tells the parable of the lost sheep, and then the parable of the lost coin. And in both of those, Jesus is driving home to the scribes and the Pharisees that God's heart yearns for those who have gone astray like the lost sheep, for them to be brought home, who are like the lost coin and then found. And so in both of the parables that come before this one, Jesus emphasizes the great rejoicing in heaven over the lost one who is found. And then he tells the parable of the prodigal, which is another story about exactly that, and also about what it means to leave home and to come home, to be lost and to be found. I think many of us here will know that when the younger son says to his father at the start of the story that he wants his inheritance, he's basically saying to his father, drop dead. The son demanding his inheritance in that way is the equivalent of saying to his father, I wish you were dead and I want to live as if you were. He wants out, he wants to leave home, he wants to live his own kind of life in his own kind of way, and almost as soon as he's received the inheritance, he's gone. The kind of life he was so eager to live, away from his physical home, away from home as a set of relationships, and as we'll see in a moment, away even from the spiritual home of his faith, all of that was a life that I guess he saw as freedom initially, but it ended up leaving him destitute and it all but destroyed him. I don't know you all well enough to know if there are elements of his story in your story or in the stories of those that you dearly love. For at least some of you though, I expect that this will be the case. And thank God there is all sorts of hope in this parable for every kind of prodigal son and daughter and every kind of parent who loves them and longs for them to return home. For the Jews of Jesus' day, though, this younger son is close to the ultimate sinner, uppercase S, exclamation point. He has smashed the fifth commandment in pieces so far from honouring his father. He despises him and he wishes he were dead and he squanders everything he's been given on wild living. And he's abandoned not just his father and his home, but also it would seem his faith. He's gone into Gentile country, a country where people keep pigs, which Jews were not permitted to do. And he ends up in the ultimate defilement for any Jew, looking after and living with the pigs. For the scribes and the Pharisees, what happened to that younger son would have been exactly what he deserved. I suspect if they had been telling this parable, 
This is where it would have stopped. See, look what happens to commandment-breaking, faith-abandoning, wicked sinners. They end up destitute and defiled, abandoned by human beings and by God. But this dissolute, destitute, defiled younger son is exactly the kind of person that God's heart yearns after. The previous two parables that Jesus told made that clear enough. The lost sheep, the lost coin, the rejoicing in heaven over the one sinner who repents. And that is what the younger son goes on to do. Sort of. Because it seems like there's a whole load more pragmatism than repentance going on there, to be honest. He realises he would just be better off back home, even if only as a servant. But it's enough. He turns aside from the life he has been living and he sets off for home, even though he expects it probably won't feel much like home anymore. Not how it used to be. While the younger son is on his way home, let's reflect a little bit on the father to whom he's returning. From the beginning of the parable, the father's behaviour will have struck the scribes and the Pharisees as very strange. When the younger son asks him for his inheritance, the father could, and probably in their minds should, have punished him. He could even have had him killed. The law offered provision for parents to have children who deeply dishonour them put to death. But instead, the father gives the son what he asks for, and I suspect that for many of the religious folks hearing this parable for the first time, the father would have come across as too loving, too weak, too indulgent. What we see, in effect, is that in his love for his son, the father is willing not only to give away his money, but to set aside his own honour. He diminishes himself to his son in every way. But he does not cease to love, to yearn, to long for the son to come home, and he does not cease to look out for him. Parents among you, you know how this is, don't you? Lying awake, late into the night, straining to hear the door open and close to know that your teenager has come home safely. Waiting for the next email or text or phone call from your child, no matter how old they are, when you know that they are far from home. And all of that is the case when everything is just fine with your child and with your relationship with your child. How much more so? when the situation is something like that of the father in this parable, where things have gone horribly off the rails. And the instant he sees his son on the road that leads to home, the father runs. And once again, the father's love means he does something totally contrary to the expectations of his culture. Here is an older man hitching up his robe and running full pelt down the road in the sight of anyone who happens to be looking. It's a disgrace, it's dishonouring, it's degrading, and all for that wicked, wastrel, younger son. But love, overpowering everything else, love. And he doesn't even let the son get to the end of his very carefully planned and rehearsed speech. Out comes the best robe, the finest ring, the fatted calf is killed, the music strikes up, there's a feast overflowing with joy, because the one who was dead has come back to life. The one who was lost has been found. And then finally, there's that elder brother. The one who's stayed home all along, stayed in the house with his father, stayed obedient to his father and to his faith and to his calling in life. The one who has always tried to do his duty, to do the right thing in every way and the one who, it turns out, has wandered just as far from home as the younger brother who ran off to his wild and dissolute life. Because in this parable, it turns out that home is not so much a place as it is a relationship. At the heart of what it means to be at home is to truly know and experience the father's love. Does the older son join the party eventually? Is he ever reconciled to his father and his younger brother? Does he ever go home again? We don't know. We can hope and pray that the Holy Spirit will bring him home too because he needs the Spirit to lead him home to the love of his father as much as ever the younger son did. 
So who do you most identify with in this parable? The younger son, the rebel, the one who ran away from home and only when everything went horribly wrong did he reassess his life and head home again. The father, the one who loves and loves and loves in spite of all the hurt and all the shame. And the one who waits and waits and waits and overflows with uncontainable love when the ungrateful wretch comes home again. The older brother, who does all the right things and wants to hoard all the love and all the benefits of home for himself, the one who wants to decide for himself who deserves a place at home and who doesn't, who wants to decide on God's behalf who deserves God's love and who doesn't. I suspect that all of us have seen ourselves in all three of them at various times, but I think at this point it's helpful to remind ourselves again of the framework for this parable, because the older brother's attitude here is exactly that of the scribes and the Pharisees at the start, which is exactly the reason why Jesus is telling us these three parables in the first place. Remember, they despise and resent Jesus for welcoming sinners and feasting with them. They see themselves as the righteous ones deserving of God's love far more than those sinners because they have done all the right things, made all the sacrifices to live obedient, faithful lives just like the older son here. And this is why they need to hear over and over again in three parables in a row about the deep rejoicing in heaven over the lost ones who are found and who come home. And this is why many of us need to hear this parable too, I suspect. Jesus is telling this parable to all of us dutiful religious types who no matter how much we say we believe in salvation by grace and how much we need that grace, we still think that somehow we deserve God's love even just a little bit and so we can earn it by what we do. And we can still somehow end up thinking that the love of God is so limited that if he gives away some to someone else, especially someone else we don't think deserves it as much as us, well, won't that mean there's less love from God to go round and left over for me? But folks, this is not how it works. It truly is, as the father in the parable says to the older son, you are always with me. Everything that I have is yours. We know that all that God has, has is already ours now and for all eternity. Like Paul says in Romans 8.32, our loving Heavenly Father did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for all of us. How then will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? So back to that question I opened with, where is home for you? Part of the point of this parable is to remind us that wherever our lives lead us, whatever our circumstances, to be at home means to be above all resting in the freely given, overflowing love of God. And we can rest assured that the Father has more than enough love for us and for anyone and everyone else he chooses to welcome home to himself. And so the plea of the parable to every single one of us is, come home. Because whether we are more like the younger brother or the older brother, we all need to return home to the love of God. Whether we've been on a quest to find our ultimate fulfillment anywhere other than the assurance of God's love for us, whether it's the resentment and anger and entitlement of thinking that who we are and what we do means we deserve God's love more than others, both of those parts are utterly exhausting. And both of those paths take us such a long way from home. Come home, rest and rejoice in the Father's love. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Please be seated. Friends, as we gather in prayer, I would uh, remind you we are a Stephen Ministry congregation. If you would like to pray with someone quietly in the chapel following worship, they will be there to be with you and to, uh, to walk with you in that time of prayer. We want to celebrate with Bree Porch and Benji, who were married here at a wonderful celebration at the Kirk yesterday, and ask God's blessing on them. And finally, uh, we'd like to surround the family of Ralph Winter upon the passing of his sister, Nancy Bigelow. Uh, please uh, let them know of our love and concern. Let us join our hearts and minds together in prayer. Holy and gracious God, you are filled with compassion. We wander away from your presence. We find ways to alienate, to isolate, to squander. Lord, help us. In times of trouble, we need to remember who we are in your grace. Lord, will you help us? when we have wandered to come to ourselves, when we are lost, to be found, when we have journeyed in our lives or in our hearts far from you, help us to come home and Lord, for some of us, help us to come home for the first time as you call us to a new sense of home. We ask your blessing on the world in this difficult time when war has leapt up again in the world. We recognize that power can be used without compassion. May your word rule the words of human beings and may your passion for peace inspire people to find ways to build for true peace. Lord, our sense of homelessness is something that, that we impose upon other people. Help us to find ways to make the world a home, a place of welcome, a place of safety. Gracious God, in your sight, nations rise and fall and pass through times of peril. We ask that you order the unruly powers. May leaders in the world be led by your wisdom. May they search for your will and see it clearly. And Lord, where any of us turn from your way, reverse our ways and help us to repent, to turn around and to come to that place of homecoming that is truly a place for all. Watch over the ways of human beings. We know that you love and know each of us by name. Do not let us forget who we are and help us also to remember the people that you remember as we seek to be your faithful people, as we seek to be your peacemakers, as we seek to be your people of grace and justice and hope and homecoming for all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
how deeply loved you are by God. And may you have many opportunities to share something of that love with everyone that you encounter this week. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace.